Hey everybody, it's Mr. Richard here again today. Um, today we're just going to um, go ahead and uh, do what some of the things like we normally do in class, just trying to keep things normal again. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to read a book to you. This is a big chapter book, so it'll take us a few days. I'm going to go ahead and read the first couple chapters today. Um, the book is called Masterpiece by Elise Broche. And uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'll read the first ch couple chapters today for you. Chapter 1, Family Emergency. Home for Marvin's family was a damp corner of the cupboard beneath the kitchen sink. Here a leaky pipe had to soften the plaster and cause it to crumble away. Just behind the wall, Marvin's family had followed out three spacious rooms, and at, as his parents often remarked, it was a perfect location. It was warm because of the hot water pipes embedded in the wall, moist to make burrowing easy, and dark and musty like all the other homes the family had lived in. Best of all, the white plastic wastebasket that loomed on one side offered a constant litter of apple cores, breadcrumbs, onion skins, candy wrappers, making the cupboard an ideal foraging ground. You know what foraging is? Foraging is when you is when you go to and you, and you look for things like. Um, if, if, you're, if you're like looking for something uh, like a, a shirt in your in your laundry basket, you forge them through to look for it. Marvin and his relatives were beetles. They had shiny black shells, six legs, excellent night vision. They were medium sized as beetles go, not much bigger than a razor. But they were very agile, good at climbing walls, scurrying across countertops, and slipping under closed doors. They lived in the large apartment of a human family, the Pompadays, in New York City. One morning, Marvin awoke to find the household in an uproar. Usually the first sounds of the day were the gentle rustlings of his parents in the next room and in the distance, the clank of pots in the Pompaday kitchen sink. But today he heard the frantic clicking of Mrs. Pompaday's high heels and her voice anxious and shrill. Just as he was beginning to wonder what had happened, his mother came looking for him in a great hurry. Marvin, she cried, come quickly, darling, we have an emergency. Marvin crawled out of the soft cotton ball that was his bed and still only half awake followed her into the living room. There his father, his uncle Albert, and his cousin Elaine were deep in conversation. Elaine ran to him and grabbed one of his legs. Mrs. Pompadour has lost her contact lens down the bathroom sink, and since you're the only one who knows how to swim, we need you to fish it out. Marvin drew back in surprise, but his cousin continued happily, Oh, what if you drown? Marvin was not nearly as thrilled at this prospect as Elaine. I won't drown, he said firmly. I'm a good swimmer. He'd practiced swimming for almost a month now. In an old juice bottle cap filled with water, he was the only member of his entire family who could swim, a skill his parents both marveled at and took credit for. Marvin has exceptional coordination, such fine control over his legs, Mama often remarked. It reminds me of my days in the ballet. When he sets his mind to something, there's no stopping him, Papa would add smugly. He's a chip off the old block. But right now, these words were little comfort to Marvin. Swimming in a bottle cap was one thing. It was half an inch deep. Swimming inside a drain pipe was something else altogether. Excuse me, my dog. Let him out, please. No, no, stop. Never mind. Let's go. Never mind. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But right now, these words were a little comfort to Marvin. Swimming in a bottle cap was one thing. It was a half inch deep. Swimming inside a drain pipe was something else altogether. He paced the room nervously. Mama was talking to Uncle Albert, looking mad. Well, I should think not, she exclaimed. He's just a child. I say, let the Pompadays call a plumber. Papa shook his head. It's too risky. If a plumber goes poking around in there, he'll see that the wall is rotting away. He'll say that they need to replace it, and that'll be the end of Albert and Edith's home. Uncle Albert nodded vigorously and beckoned to Marvin. Marvin, my boy, what do you say? You'll have to go down the bathroom pipe and find the contact lens. Think you can handle it? Marvin hesitated. Mama and Papa were still arguing. Now Papa looked at him unhappily. I'd go myself, son. You know I would, if I could swim. No one could swim like Marvin, Elaine declared, but even Marvin may not be able to swim well enough. There's probably a lot of water in that pipe now. Who knows how far down he'll have to go, she paused dramatically. Maybe he'll never make it back up to the surface, 
Hush it, Lane, said Uncle Albert. Marvin grabbed the fragment of pe peanut shell that he used as a float when he swam in his own pool at home. He took a deep breath. I can try, at least, he said to his parents. I'll be careful. Then I'm going with you, Mamas decided, to make sure you aren't foolhardy, and if it looks the least bit dangerously, it, we won't risk it. So they set off for the Pompadays bathroom with Uncle Albert leading the way. Marvin followed close behind his mother, the peanut shell tucked awkwardly under one of his legs. And that was chapter one. So let's go ahead and go ahead and dig into chapter two. It's called Down the Drain. So I wonder, what do you guys think is going to happen? So now he's got he's got to reach down in there to go get a, a contact lens for this the people. Do you think he's going to make it or not? What do you think? So chapter two. It took them a fair bit of time to reach the bathroom. First, they had to crawl out of the cupboard into the bright morning light of the Papa Day's kitchen. There, baby William was banging on his high chair with a spoon, scattering Cheerios all over the floor. Ordinarily, the beetles might have waited in the shadows to snatch one and carry it off for lunch, but today they were more important tasks ahead. They scuttled along the baseboard. You know what the word scuttled means? Scuttled means they just they, they kind of just hurried along like around the baseboard. Have you ever seen an ant and you get near an ant and it like and it like moves really quickly? That's what scuttled means. So they scuttled along the baseboard of the living room and then began to the exhausting journey over the oriental rug, which was at least was dark blue, so they didn't have to worry about being seen. All the way to the bathroom, Marvin could hear him, Mr. and Mrs. Pompadour yelling at each other. I don't understand why you can't just take the pipe apart and find it, Mrs. Pompadour complained. That's what Carl would have done. Carl was Mrs. Pompadour's first husband. You take the pipe apart and find it, and flood the bathroom, and then we'll have to replace more than your contact lens, Mr. Pompadour fumed. He stomped to the phone. I'm calling a plumber. Oh, fine, says Mrs. Pompadour. He'll take all day to get here. I'll have to leave for work in 20 minutes, and I won't be able to find my way to the door without my contact lenses. James, Mrs. Pompadour's son from her first marriage, stood in the doorway. He was 10 years old, a thin boy with big feet, serious gray eyes, and a scattering of freckles across his cheeks. He would be 11 tomorrow, and Marvin and his family had been trying to think of something nice to do for his birthday, since they infinitely preferred him to the rest of the Pompadour family. He was quiet and reasonable, unlikely to make sudden movements or raise his voice. Seeing him now, Marvin remembered how James had caught had caught sight of him once. A few weeks ago, when Marvin was dragging home an M&M &M he'd found for her, the family dessert, Marvin had been so excited about his good luck that he'd forgotten to stay close to the baseboard. There he was, out in the open sea of cream-colored tile in the kitchen, when James's blue sneaker stopped along beside him. Marvin panicked, dropped the M&M &M and ran for his life, but James only crouched down and watched him, never saying a word. Marvin hadn't told his parents about that particular close call. He'd vowed to himself that he'd be more careful in the future. Do you know what the word vowed means? Well, vowed means that you, you promised that it'll happen, that you're, you're going to just make sure that, you know, I promise that I'll make sure, you know, that it, that, I, that will happen. So now James shifted thoughtfully on those same blue sneakers. You could wear your glasses, Mom, he said. Oh, fine, said Mrs. Pompadour. Where are my glasses? Fine. I guess it doesn't matter what I look like when I meet clients. Maybe I should just go to work in my bathrobe. By this time, Uncle Albert, Marvin, and his mother had reached the door of the bedroom, and the bathroom lay just beyond. Unfortunately, the three humans were effectively blocking the route. Three jittery pairs of feet, one in sneakers, one in high heels, and one in loafers made it hard to find a safe path. Stay close to me, Mama told Marvin. She hurried along the door frame, dodging the spikes of Mrs. Pompadour's heels. Marvin and Uncle Albert followed. They made it up the bathroom wall to the sink without mishap. Normally, the light tile would have made them easy targets for a rolled-up newspaper or the bottom of a slipper. But the Pompadours were so engrossed in their argument that they didn't even no notice the shiny black beetle scrambling onto the sink. I'll keep a lookout, Uncle Albert said. You two go ahead. Marvin and his mother tumbled and slid down the smooth side of the sink to the drain. They ducked under the sil silver st stopper and stood on the edge of the open pipe, staring into the blackness. Sorry, I think my puppy wants, a, wants me to read to him, too. 
Marvin could hear a distant trickling sound. As his eyes adjusted, he saw water murking and uninviting a few inches below. He thought of Cousin Elaine's grim prediction and shuddered. Why hadn't his mother taken a firmer stand against this? Well, here I go, he said to Mama, who promptly grabbed his legs and held fast. Now don't do anything rash, darling, she told him. Go slowly and come right back to me if it seems dangerous. Okay, Marvin promised. He clutched his peanut shell float and took a deep breath, and he launched himself into the void. The void would be like when you look into something that's really dark, and you look and it's black and you can't see anything. That's because there, it's void. You can't see anything at all. Okay. He barely remembered to shut his eyes before the cold water closed over his head. Pedaling his legs frantically, he came bobbing back up to the surface. The cloudy water tasted vaguely of toothpaste. It smelled horrible. Marvin, Marvin, are you all right? Marvin's voice echoed through the thin pipe. I'm fine, he called back. He swam through the scummy water, which was littered with every nasty thing that might wash down a human's drain. Bits of food, hair, slivers of soap. He wanted to throw up. Do you see it yet, his mother called. No, Marvin answered. He suddenly realized he had no idea what a contact lens even looked like. Then, as he was about to turn back, he did see something. A thin plastic disc stuck in the side of the pipe. It looked just like the fruit bowl Mama used at home. Out of breath, he shot back up to the surface. I found it, Mama, he yelled. Oh, good, darling, his mother breathed a sigh of relief. Now we better hurry before someone turns on the faucets and washes both of us away. Marvin discovered he couldn't hold on to the contact lens and the peanut shell at the same time. Reluctantly, he had to let go of his flute, took a deep breath, and plunged under the water again. In the distance, he heard his mother cry, Marvin, your float! He moved his leg swiftly, unburdened by the peanut shell, and glided down through the dark water. He swam straight to the contact lens and clasped it with his two legs, pulling it away from the side of the pipe. He shot quite quickly back to the surface. Through the lens, he could see his mother wavy and distorted, looming above him. She crawled down the side of the pipe to the water's edge, beckoning to him. Oh, Marvin, thank heavens you are a wonder, darling. What leg control? I wish my old ballet crowd could see you. She took the lens from him. Whew. The water smells positively vile. Vile is just another word for kind of disgusting, nasty. And what a fuss over this little thing. Why, it looks exactly like my fruit bowl. Holding it gingerly on her back, Mama crawled up the pipe. She scooted under the stopper with Marvin, closed behind her, and together they dragged the lens up the side of the sink. Uncle Albert rushed down to meet them. By George, you've done it, he cried. Marvin, my boy, you're a hero, a hero. Wait till I tell your Aunt Edith. Marvin beamed modestly. He flexed his legs and shook them dry. Let's see where shall we put it, Mama asked. They looked around. By the faucet, maybe, Marvin suggested. That way it won't get washed down the drain again. They placed the lens near the hot water handle and dashed behind a green water glass just as James walked into the bathroom. After all this trouble, you better find it, Mama whispered grimly. Marvin kept his eyes on the contact lens. It glistened in the morning light, a faint blue color. They could hear Mr. Pompadan on the phone with the plumber. What's that? Oh, okay, I'll look. He bellowed. James, are you in the bathroom? Make yourself useful. Are the pipes in that there copper or galvanized steel? James stood at the sink. I don't know, he said, but Mom, I found your contacts lens. It's right here by the faucet. And then what a commotion. Mrs. Pompadet rushing into the bathroom in disbelief. Mr. Pompadet loudly apologizing to the plumber. And James lifting the contacts lens in his outreach palm. Well, I guess that's that, Mama said to Marvin as soon as the bathroom emptied. We'd better head back and let your father know you're all right. So Mama, Uncle Albert, and Marvin ambled home. Ambled means they just, they kind of were just proud and walking back because they, they, they did what they meant, they were reached out to do. Where everyone greeted them joyfully. Papa, Aunt Edith, and Elaine all patted Marvin on his shell, but nobody wanted to hug him. He was wet and slimy and smelled overpoweringly of disgusting drain water. I think I need a bath, Marvin said. And then Mama and Papa fussed over him, filling the bottle cap with warm water and adding a single grain of turquoise dishwashing detergent. Marvin sank into the bubbles and floated into the pool to his heart's content until he was shiny and clean again. Well, that was the first two chapters. So 
let's just uh, go ahead and let's get this whole book read together. I started this on on Class Dojo, but I didn't see anybody really um, going on there. So maybe everybody will recognize this site. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to think of three words that you heard me read to you today. And I want you to, um, if you don't know what they mean, I want you to either talk about it with a parent or your, one of your brothers and sisters. And then I want you to find some way to figure out what that word means. And uh, that will be your little bit of homework um, since I haven't been able to do that. But uh, I want you all to stay safe and healthy. Um, just uh, get all your schoolwork done and stay on track. But most importantly, stay safe and healthy and have a great day. Bye-bye.